Um, all right, so the will meaning the author gives to the text surrounding an immediate text. I'll give you a clue. The word text is in it. Context. Context. Here we go. Been that after four weeks. Thanks for the clue. All right. All right. Uh, ways the text may be applied that the author may not have been aware of, but are legitimate. Implication. There we go. Context. Oh, context. What's the second one? Implications. Implications. Come on. No talking during class. Pay attention. What? All right. The stuff talked about in the text. Oh, I skipped one. Are we going to do the third one? Oh. Oh, that's my fault. My scribe missed that one. Uh, <laughs> what the author meant to convey. Meaning. The meaning. So number three is the meaning. What the author no, meant no. to convey is the meaning. Because we've gone over it. Now, oh, we did this for ten weeks. I mean, I know it's four weeks off, but ten weeks. Uh, now, the stuff. She put in quotations. She was like, stuff. Uh, the stuff talked about in the passage or in the text. Two words. First one starts with an S. Second one starts with an M. Subject meaning. There you go. Subject meaning. Subject matter. That's the filler. That's the stuff that makes the story make sense. Such as the thatched roofing when, when they dug in to see Jesus. Okay? Uh, next, the mental... Uh, the reader's mental grasp of the meaning. Interpretation. Close. Understanding. 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 And the expression of the reader's understanding, that is interpretation. Yeah. All right. Words have a range of meaning that the author works within. This one's the long one. No one knows? Norms. Norm. Language and utterance. Ooh, yeah. there you go. Norms. Uh, oops. Norms of language and utterance. There you go. Norms, could you say it again? Norms of language and utterance. And that just means that a word can have multiple meanings, um, but the author never gives a word a meaning that it doesn't have at all. So if I say the, the cake is sweet, sweet has multiple meanings. Like I might say like, oh, it's a sweet day outside, or my wife is sweet. Doesn't mean I lick her, but, uh, but <laughs> like cake is sweet. Um, but I won't use the word sweet for something that doesn't matter. Like I would say like, oh, this is a sweet chair. Like, there's nothing truly wonderful about this chair, and it definitely doesn't taste that way. But anyways, okay. How the reader responds to the meaning of the text? Comprehension. Nope. Interpretation. We've already used that one. Starts with an S. Stop. I. Significance. Significance. I didn't catch this. See <laughs> Which one are you missing, Dan? Uh, what, what was that one? Significance. Significance? Okay, and the, the two prior to that? The, the long one, the one you have a big blank for, yes. is norms of language and utterance. And I abbreviate language to make it fit. And then the expression of the reader's understanding, that's an interpretation. So when you tell someone what you think it means, that's interpretation. And the last one, a conclusion based on the, uh, uh, sorry, reached on the basis of evidence and reason. This is also a science term. And that is inference. Inference. It is an English term. <laughs> So, all right. Okay. 
Okay, so uh, so now we'll start our look at how do we interpret the book of Revelation. So the important place to start is, and it's not on here, so you'll have to listen carefully and I'll tell you when to fill in the blanks, okay? Um, what is the book of Revelation? Because if we misunderstand the book of Revelation, uh, that can lead us to get confused, right? So the word Revelation means the uncovering or unveiling of something previously hidden. Hidden is that next word, okay? Hidden or kept secret. So the idea here is that um, this revelation is going to unveil something that was previously unknown. All right? Now, what is the revelation primarily about? Okay? So if you're if you want to, you don't have to, but Revelation chapter 1, verse 1 says, the revelation of Jesus Christ. All right? And what that means is it is the revelation of Jesus Christ is then an unveiling of Jesus Christ, right? Um, so the purpose of Revelation is to reveal or unveil Jesus, right? And so we see Jesus, we, we come to know Jesus in a different way through the book of Revelation than we do in his lively ministry, right? He, he presents himself differently now that he's in his glorified, resurrected stance than he did during the earthly ministry. So the Re book of Revelation is primarily about him, right? Um, so he is the is the primary thing, not world events. That's the next line. Events or persons, right? So unfortunately, there are many people when they come to the Book of Revelation, they bring their newspaper. All right. And I saw a preacher do this. He gets up to talk, and he's talking about uh, the spy balloon from China and how that's proving something from Revelation. All right. Now, that is not the point of Revelation. The point of Revelation is for us to come to a better understanding of who Jesus is, not so we're looking at every event or every person. You know, there's some rabbi. Oh, that's going to be, this is in Revelation. Or, you know, there's a flood in this part of the country, in this part of the world. That's Revelation. But that's not the point. The point is, is to reveal Jesus to us. So Revelation is not written to be enigmatic. Uh, enigmatic meaning mysterious or uncomprehendable, but was expected to be understood, right? So when John delivers this apocalypse, this revelation to the audience, he is expecting the audience who's reading it to know what he's talking about, right? Uh, and so it's not supposed to be some sort of mysterious thing. The theme of revelation is ultimately the victory of Christ and his church over the serpent, his allies, and the kingdom of the world. Right? That's the big narrative of the story, right? Jesus and the church wins. Satan, his allies, and the world kingdoms, they collapse. They can't thwart him, right? And the purpose of this is in order to encourage, inspire, and, and comfort Christians facing persecution in an anti-Christian world. Now, we are beginning to experience an anti-Christian world, right? But the Roman church that John was writing to, uh, or the Christian church that uh, John was writing to, uh, they were dealing with, with being killed for the faith. At this point, Christianity was outlawed. Uh, uh, either right around this time or shortly after is when you saw them being thrown into the Colosseums. They were blamed for the fire in Rome. All these things are taking place, right? The intent of, Re of Revelation is not to divide Christians over eschatology. So the next word is divide, right? The purpose of Revelation is not so Christians can get to camps and argue and fight with each other over who has the best interpretation. We all have. Well, most of us probably have some sort of idea of what we think the end is going to look like. Um, but it is, that's not the intent of Revelation. All right, now the next one. Interpreting Revelation as an epistle. It's also not on here. Um, so the, the book of Revelation is a revelation. It is an apocalypse. But what we see here is it is a letter written to seven churches in Asia Minor, right? So that's the next line is seven, right? And we see that in chapters two and three. So John here is writing to a specific group of people with them in mind, with the expectation that they're going to read his letter and understand and be encouraged and strengthened through this, right? He is not writing a bestseller. He's not writing a book that's meant to go put, be put on a shelf somewhere that people will buy. He's writing with real people in mind. 
Now, as with epistles, uh, interpreting epistles, it helps to reconstruct the historical backdrop of where the letters were taken, right? So when possible, it's helpful if we can reconstruct what that looked like, right? So I'm gonna use probably the most famous, uh, popular example from the church in Laodicea. Uh, if you've been a part of the Christian church for very long, you've probably heard sermons about the church in Laodicea, right? Uh, so I'm just going to read that for us here. It's verses 14 through 22. Uh, if you want to turn there with me in your Bible, we'll be looking at a number of places there um, or on your phone or whatever it is that you like to use. But let me read that for us. So Revelation chapter 3, starting in verse 14 to the end of the chapter. And to the angel of the church in Laodicea write, The words of the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of God's creation. I know your works. You are neither cold nor hot. Would that you were neither cold nor hot. So because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. For you say, I am rich. I have prospered. I need nothing. Not realizing that you are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined by fire, so that you may be rich and, and white garments, so that you may clothe yourself in the shame of your nakedness and not be seen, and sell to anoint your eyes, so that you may see. Those who I love, I reprove and discipline, so be zealous and repent. Repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in to him and eat with him and he with me. The one who conquers, I will grant him to sit with me on my throne, as I also conquered and sat down with my father on his throne. He who has ears, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. All right? Now, the backdrop of Laodicea is helpful. If we understand what the church in Laodicea was, was like, what the city was like, it'll help us interpret this passage. First, Laodicea was known for its wealth. Right? It was also known as a place in which medicinal ointments were created, and it was known for its woolen industry. So it created clothing out of wool. So Jesus' words recorded by John pertain to this audience specifically all right, and directly. So in verses 14 through 16, we see this lukewarmness. All right? uh, it's the lukewarmness is so disgusting, Jesus says, I spit it out. And so he's comparing them to the lukewarmness found in the city of Laodicea. And Jesus isn't just coming up with his own idea. He is saying that you are like the water in the city and I will spit it out. Now, why is this water like this? So the city of Laodicea did not have enough water to support itself. So they had to bring in water from two other locations. One was from Colossae, which sat up in the mountains or had, had mountain fed springs. So the water in Colossae was nice and cold. So you can just imagine if it's a hot day, how enjoyable this cold mountain spring water would be, right? So that's good. In Aeropolis, which is to, I think, the south of where Laodicea is, they were known for their hot springs. Not great for, for drinking, but a hot spring is a delight. It's therapeutic to go rest in it. So just like a hot tub is therapeutic, it has beneficial things to it. So they had these hot springs. But wherever the water came from to get to Laodicea, by the time it got there, it was lukewarm. It wasn't refreshingly cold and it wasn't therapeutically warm. It had no real enjoyment factor to it. It was just room temperature water. So this is what Jesus is saying. He's saying that they are like this. In their wealth, they are like this. Without their, they don't have, uh, they're neither beneficially uh, one way or the other. Now, the way many preachers have applied this passage is that cold refers to people who have no spiritual life and hot is people who have vibrant spiritual life. That's completely the opposite of what John is talking about, what Jesus is saying. He, Jesus isn't saying that the cold water from Colossae is bad and the hot water from Heropolis is good. That's not what he's saying. He's just using actual um, water springs that they would have been drawing from to highlight what the church in Laodicea is. The people in Laodicea had water that was not desirable. It was neither cold nor hot, 
And that's what Jesus is saying about the church and their sin, because they think of themselves as wealth, uh, wealthy. So in verse 17, we see that they assume their self-sufficiency because, they are wealth, because of their wealth. So I, I missed the word. You may have gotten it. Um, underlined springs. So Colossae's cold mountain springs. And the next one is verse 17. They assume, assumed self-sufficiency because of wealth. So verse 17 says, For you say, I am rich. I have prospered. I need nothing. Right? This is what wealth does. I think this is an issue that a lot of times we in the American church suffer because we are wealthy. Even if we don't feel wealthy individually compared to um, compared to our neighbors and people around us, like, you know, we're not Bill Gates, we're not um, people like that, uh, but we are significantly wealthy and that we generally don't have much need. Most of us don't have to worry about whether or not we're going to be able to feed ourselves the next day. And in the ancient world, if you had food every day, you were pretty close to being wealthy, right? Um, so we see that. We also see a reference to, to wealth, ointment, and clothing in verses 18 through 19. So it says, um, so I counsel you, uh, counsel you to buy for me gold refined by fire so that you may be rich. All right, so here he's saying you, have, you think you have riches, but the riches that I offer, you're not coming for. You're not actually rich unless you have that. And white garments so that you may clothe yourself and the shame of your nakedness may not be seen. So here he's attacking them. This is a, a, a center for wool and enterprise. And yet he's saying, you think you have clothing, but you don't. You're naked in your shame. And sell to anoint, uh, anoint your eyes so that you may see. So he highlights these things that were well known in that region of things that this place produced. And he's saying, you think you have these things, but you don't. Right? So he's attacking them in that direction. All right? So here, this is why when we interpret the book of Revelation, it's helpful for as best we can to know the circumstances and what's going on in the Roman Empire at that time. And next week, we'll look at some examples of different things that were happening in Rome. So when we look at the seven seals um, or, the, or, the, or the bowls or the trumpets, right? These aren't just strange illusions that John's pulling out of nowhere. nowhere. A lot of times, these things are matching up to what is going on in the world. And he's using these things to show them what, um, what life will be like. We'll look at that next week, right? But there are other illusions that we just have a difficult time knowing what he's talking about, right? So if you turn back to 2.17, it says, let me find it. Uh, it says, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who conquers, I will... Uh, give give some of the hidden manna, and I will give him a white stone with a new name written on the white stone that no one knows except the one who receives it. Right? What in the world is this white stone? Right? When John's writing to this audience, when he's writing uh, to the church in in Pergamum, they likely would have known exactly what the white stone meant. Unfortunately, we're not hundred percent sure. So it could be that it's some sort of admission ticket, um, sort of, sort of, it allows you to get into something. Uh, it could be uh, a symbol that represents that one's guilt has been removed, a vote, uh, a jury vote of not guilty, or it might be some sort of amulet with the divine name on it. We don't know. Um, and so it's difficult at times because some of this imagery is no longer known to us. That first audience would have known. Another example is a little bit earlier in verse 2, uh, 13, where it says, I know where you dwell, where Satan's throne is. We don't know what John meant by Satan's throne, right? I mean, we, we, can, we can look at different evidences and, and think we might know, but some examples, it could be the temple of Zeus, which, is, which was there. Just one second, Joe. Uh, it could refer to the worship of the emperor. Um, and so there was... Uh, there would have likely been uh, emperor cults, so that believed that the emperor himself was God and worshipped him, or a god, and worshipped him. Or it could be, uh, there's another temple there for Ascalipus, Ascalipius, I'm not sure I pronounce that, who was the Greek god of healing. So it could have been another temple. And maybe, maybe Christians were going to that temple, they were sort of blending the two religions together, right? They're saying we're Christians, but they're still participating in the pagan worship because of the benefits 
that would have brought in their society. Uh, it's sort of like, you know, 20, 30 years ago when unbelievers went to church because you go to church because, it, you know, no one's going to buy a used car from you or no one's going to call you to fix car, call you to fix their car unless you go to church. And so people would go to church because of the social implications, not because of actual love for Jesus. In the ancient world, Christians would have been tempted to go into pagan worship because of the social connections it would have afforded them. So there are times when we're not 100% sure how to interpret it. We do the best we can uh, to piece things together, but ultimately we're not sure. Yeah, Joe. Did you say about Satan's throne? Did yeah. You mentioned Satan's throne. That's, not, that's in Pergamos, historically. In where? Pergamos. Okay. Yeah. And so, yeah, so... That, and that may be what it's referring to. It's just, it's difficult to know. He's writing here, it's into the letter to Pergamum. Um, so that could have been, you know, in that same region. So just ultimately, we do our best to, to try to piece things together, um, but we're not always sure. All right, so next thing we're going to do, this will be up on the board, um, and that is interpreting Revelation as prophecy. Now we'll get into this a little bit more next week. Again, right now, my, my, my intent is not to, uh, to interpret the book of Revelation. Um, I really think I want to start doing that, but that's going to be months and months and months, not something we do in a couple, couple weeks. Um, but um, how do we understand it as prophecy? So there are five main views for interpreting Revelation's prophecy, right? So here is the first one. Number one is referred to as preterist. Preterist. Now, the preterist view is that the events recorded in the book of Revelation either happened before or shortly after the book of Revelation was written. Right? So in verse 1 of chapter 1, this is what we see. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show to his servants that th the things that must be take that must soon take place right so because it says these things must soon take place the pret preter preterist believe that these things have likely all been fulfilled so when you look at the book of revelation you see all these different sort of judgments and seals and things like that the preterists say those things have been completed now you have what are referred to as full preterist Right? And they believe that all eschatological events have already been fulfilled. And this has been deemed heresy by the church from very early on. I don't remember what year the church deemed it as heresy, but a full preterist would say that everything in, the, in Revelation has taken place, including the return of Christ, the resurrection, the glorification of humanity, and we are currently living in the new heavens and the new earth. Right? How desperately sad would that be if it's true, okay? Um, and it doesn't coincide super well with what Paul said, because Paul assumes to, you know, writes to assume that there won't be any more death or suffering or anything like that, and uh, we still see death, right? So full preterist has largely been said, no, that, that's not the case, and has been deemed heresy. Then you have what's referred to as partial preterism, which says that everything up until the return of Christ has been fulfilled, right? And so basically everything in the book of Revelation is all referring to things that happened around 70 AD with the destruction of Jerusalem. And then shortly after that, within probably 50, 60 years, when that audience that received John's letter would have been alive, right? Uh, but they don't say that, you know, Jesus has already come back, right? So that's, that's partial preterism. Now, the next one is called a futurist. So, futurist. Right? And these individuals say that everything after Revelation 6, so the Revelation 6 is kind of like when we're really kind of dealing with um, the, the letters, the, the scroll of the Lamb, the seals, everything after that is still yet to happen. All right, so we're waiting for everything to take place. Uh, this is generally what individuals would refer to uh, themselves as dispensationalist, would fall sort of in this camp. Um, and if you've ever read like the Tim LaHaye Left Behind series or watched the Left Behind movies, 
uh, this is sort of the camp they fall in, all right? Um, everything in Revelation is still waiting, all right? People who fall into the futurist categories are usually the ones who are constantly looking for some event, some person to show like, okay, now we're on the verge. So the futurists are the ones who are always looking for some sort of event that means Jesus is going to come back, you know, soon or the rapture is going to happen soon or something like that, right? That's where the futurists fall. The next is the historist um, one. So, uh, so it's spelled like historic with an ist on the end. And what they would say is that as you read through the book of Revelation, what you see are different ages of the church. So one section of Revelation talks about the early church. Then the next, re next section talks about um, maybe the, the expansion of, church, of the church in the Roman Empire. Then it talks about the medieval period. Then it talks. And so the idea is that every part of Revelation sort of unveil, unveils a new and different um, part of the church era. The last technical one is the idealist. Okay. The idealist says that the point of the Bible or point of Revelation is just a symbolic presentation of the timeless struggle between good and evil, right? And so it's not, it's not about things that already happened. It's really not about things in the future. It's just showing that good and evil have always been at war with each other, right? Now, the last one is not really a position. Um, might even call it a cop-out, um, but it's actually a position I take, um, which is the eclectic. Okay? And that's what it does is it accepts the strengths of the other views without being one-sided. I put a yet there, but um, you can just mark out the yet, okay? Um, What's the yet for? I don't know. Um, I was going to say something. Is that a typo? Is this the one that posts on? Oh, what did I make? Where did I make a typo? Well, I don't know. It says it is abusive. Uh, the two lines down from the springs. Oh, With the abuse word in there. It's it is abuse to. Oh, it is a an abuse and abuse to the passage. Sorry, yeah, my bad. Okay, it's abuse to the pa to passage. Okay, so and abuse to the okay. to the passage. Sorry, passage yeah. and abuse. I should have my wife proofread these. <laughs> I was gonna say something negative about this view. Um, so, so the you know, the issue is is that sometimes. When you don't stand really strong on any of these points and you take a more eclectic view, sometimes you don't really have a strong stance at all, okay? Um, but, but I take what we call, would call an eclectic view, right? I think much of Revelation is highlighting things that took place during um, 70 AD, especially with the collapse of of Judaism and the end of the of the Jewish era um, and the start of the church age. So the age of Judaism ended, the age of the church began. Um, and and so, but there are future things. So I think the return of Christ is future. Um, the new heavens, new earth, things like that. I think those things are still future. So, and we can, we can talk more about these things later. Next week, um, I want to go through sort of the two main um, ways to understand the millennium. Um, and uh, I go back and forth almost every day on the millennium, uh, when the millennium is, and things like that. Um, but we'll look through the millennium. Um, this is in one place, in one part of the Bible, um, chapter 20, uh, and it divides Christians way more than it should. So, um, and what's interesting is that in, so, so there are two main categories and then there's two subcategories and within our church, um, between Dan, Jason, and myself, we none are in any of the same categories. Uh, Jason's in a different category from me. Uh, me and Dan are in the same big category, but then we're on different parts of that category. Um, 
and we all love each other, respect each other, value each other. And, uh, and so ultimately, even if you disagree with me next week and you agree with Dan or you agree with Jason or you don't agree with any of us and you take a position that me and none of us take, um, <laughs> it's not worth dividing over, all right? Because what matters is that Jesus is coming back and will make all things new. Um, and so, but we'll, we'll talk more about that. So, but those views, so if you're, um, if you're a preterist, you're going to be, you know, partial preterist, you're going to be closer to Dan and I. If you're a futurist, you're going to be closer to Jason. But we'll talk about those things um, a little bit next week, okay? Uh, any, any questions? Again, I'm not looking like dig deep into Revelation tonight. I'm really just trying to give you guys sort of the foundation so you can do it on your own. But any, any questions about this? No? Okay, good. Now I want to get to my favorite part. <laughs> All right, uh, we don't we won't have to spend spend all of our night doing this, but this is my favorite part when we actually get to to look at the Word of God and uh, and discuss the Word of God together. So uh, let me pray for us again, ask God's blessing on us for this, and then we'll look at uh, Hebrews chapter twelve, verses one and two. Lord, we thank you so much for the goodness of your grace to us, the love and the compassion you show to us. The fact that you have given us your word and that you give us the opportunity as your people to discuss and think through it. And so, Father, as we go through this exercise that we might uh, learn and discipline ourselves in the, uh, in the work of studying your word and thinking through your word as we, we practice that skill here together now. Uh, Father, may it also be a time of worship as we delight in, in you and especially from this text as we delight in Christ and his accomplishment for us. So, Lord, bless us now in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, so Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. Therefore, so that'll be important. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and the sin which clings so closely, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith who, for the joy that was set before him, endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. All right. Okay, so what are some things that we, uh, what are some things that we see? Clouds of witnesses. All right, good. Clouds of witnesses. Oh. Clouds. <laughs> Clouds of witnesses. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. All right. Clouds of witnesses. Uh, I think that's a reference to to the internet and the cloud. Oh. Oh, before oh, So you're going to use the uh, futurist interpretation of Revelation for every book of the Bible now. Well, just this particular verse. Okay. Yeah, Joe. <laughs> Agree with what he just said. <laughs> okay. When I, when I was first asked by Pastor, it doesn't matter, a long time ago, he said, What do you think of the internet? You know, and his son was a top gun fighter instructor, all this stuff. And I said, Satan now has artificial omnipresence. Mm. Mm. Okay. <laughs> that may be true in some ways. I mean, not omnipresence, but... No, um, only God has omnipotence, omnipresence. Satan now has it artificially. Yeah. Gotcha. Okay. I knew it. All right. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Um, but I like looking at the first word first. And what's the first word? Therefore. And therefore. And when you see therefore, what do you, what do you ask? What's the therefore, therefore? Why is it there? All right? So it's pointing back to at least chapter 11. Oh, really? Right? What is the therefore, therefore? Right? And so... It suggests that something else was just said before it. Right. And what came right before it? What's chapter 11? The great hall of faith. The hall of faith. Right? These great pioneers of the faith. Right? Jesus is the great pioneer. We'll see that at the end. But these great pioneers of the faith who endured to the end... And so I think that they are the cloud of witnesses. Right? You don't want to fail. Adam didn't fail. You don't want to fail. Moses didn't fail. Right? Even those guys who got cut up and fed to wild animals, they didn't fail. You can endure to the end. 
Don't give up. Keep running. Okay? So. So then is, the, is it in the cloud? Because, because the childhood picture of, you know, Jesus comes in the clouds and the angels are in the clouds. So this is, these people you're referring to, the historical people who have not failed God. There. Yeah, so I'm not 100% sure how cloud is here. I don't know if he means like they're in the heavenly realms, sort of looking down upon us. Um, but we know that eventually we're going to get to a race. Um, please, don't, please don't make noises. Uh, we know we're eventually going to get to a race. And so it might even have like the idea of like a stadium seating where, you know, you're looking up and it's like you're surrounded by these people. Um, but the idea is that you have a whole bunch of people watching you. And I think this witness, this cloud of witness, is connected things back to what is sometimes referred to the Hall of Faith. Those great um, people that we can look to to encourage us. Right? Um, now, what are they witnesses of? I don't, I don't know. I don't know if these are witnesses, um, witnesses of, of us in our race, if that's what he means. Or they are... Um, used in a way that he sometimes uses the word witness others, but witnesses of Christ, right? So we are called to be witnesses and we give witness to Christ. So I'm not sure if they are witnessing us in our race or if they are witnesses of God, those who give, um, who give witness to the, See, I the goodness of God. Pioneers. No, no, no. You just explained it. That's who the witnesses are. They're no, no, no. We're by. I know they're and witnesses. They're yeah. there I think they're, they're witnesses. I just don't know what they're witnesses of. I don't know if they're witnesses of watching us or if they're those who are ready to give testimony for Christ. Right? So, like, if, you, if, you're, in a, if you're in a jury or if you're in a trial, you get called up as a witness. And that means you have to give testimony. I don't know if this cloud of witness is going to give testimony of us because they're watching us or if they're going to give testimony of Christ because they are the ones who've endured in the faith. And so they give testimony of God. Yeah, that's what you just said. Maybe, yeah. So, um, all the above. All the above. There we go. Okay. Um, but we are surrounded by them, right? Uh, they're all around us. Okay. And that's why I put this idea of surrounded, sort of like a stadium, right? So we're in this, in this uh, big circus, this big oval thing to run our race, and then they're just seated all around us. Okay, so then, um, and I assume that many of you have seen, uh, heard this passage before. Uh, oh, I like the we. Who's the we? Believers. Huh? Believers, yeah. Um, and I like that the author of Hebrews um, identifies himself with us, mm -hmm. right? Um, it's not, not you guys are surrounded, but we. So the author is identifying himself with us. And then we see, let us, and we're going to see us a bunch, okay? But let us lay aside every weight. Anyone ever heard a good sermon on this and knows a good illustration for this? Do you have something? I was, just, I was thinking about, uh, you know, when you're, when you're training the weight, you know, when you go to, to deadlift or when you go to you know, do some bench presses, sometimes the weight can become overwhelming and you have somebody else right there to pick that load up and put it back onto the rack for yeah. you so that you don't bear it anymore. Yeah. Yeah. So we, so in, in those things, we want extra weight, right? Mm -hmm. But in right. running, we don't want extra weight. Yeah. So like, uh, I think it was John MacArthur who I either listened to or read his sermon on this. And he said, you know, if you go to the Olympics and you see a runner get out there, and he's wearing boots, you know, jeans, and a big heavy jacket. No one's gonna go up to him and say, you're breaking the rules. You're not allowed to wear those things. But no runner's gonna wear those things, right? The runner wants to wear you know, the shortest shorts you can, the lightest jersey you can, the lightest shoes possible. You wanna get off every weight you can possibly get rid of in order that you might run that race more effectively. And so here, I think the author of the Hebrews is saying, Whatever it is that's encumbering your life, even if the things aren't wrong, right? There are many good things in the life, but if there's anything that's encumbering your ability to run, even if they are legal things, get rid of them. Shut them to the side because it's a long, hard race. And if you're going to finish the race, you don't want to be encumbered by some unnecessary weights. 
right? Even if they're not technically sinful. Um, and then the sin which clings so closely. Uh, so this one I did a little bit of work for. Um, so cling, uh, the word can be something that, that threatens or troubles us persistently. So that's how he's identifying sin here, right? So sin, which is contrary to God's law, it clings to us. It, it constantly troubles us. Uh, I've even heard people talk about like uh, it it'd be something that would cause the runner to stumble, um, cause the runner to fall down, right? So we don't want anything like that. We need to get rid of all of that sin. We, we shed that from us, right? Um, next, let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, All right? So again, we have this us, so we're, we're a part of this. Now, if it says run with endurance, the race, okay? So I think of race here, I think what he's, what he's identifying is the race is the Christian life. And if the Christian life is one that needs endurance, what, is that, what do you think that means? It's hard. It's hard. And um, so difficult, but also what? Long. Long, right? It's not a sprint. It's not a sprint, right? It, it, this is not a 100-meter dash. This is a lifelong commitment of drudgery at times. Right? I never ran a marathon. It used to be on my bucket list. I don't think it's there anymore. <laughs> I don't think I'm perfectly happy never running a marathon. Um, but it used to be. But I've known a handful of people that run it. And they say once you hit mile, you know, some, some are better, but usually t my, mile 20 to 22, 23, the last ones are absolutely miserable. There's nothing enjoyable about it. It's an absolute drudgery that you hate your life. Your body just screaming at you, stop running, stop running. And you see these individuals who come across the line and they like just collapse because their bodies are just completely give out, all right? That's the Christian life, all right? Um, right? Um, now, again, we experience the Christian life somewhat different, right? Um, you know, speaking to the to the couple I spoke to earlier and their work in Indonesia, I recognize that the Christian life in Indonesia could be very difficult, very different from the, from the Christian life in the United States. But it's, not, it's never just easy. If it's easy, uh, it likely means that we're not running the race as well as we should be running, okay? And notice here that it is set before us. What does that mean? Uh-huh. So it's the race that, that God has in front of us. I just heard a quote yesterday um, from someone that was doing a seminar, and he said that he went to go do race car driving. And when he was driving, the, they were going around these corners and they were about to go really fast around the next corner and his instructor was next to him and he said, you must look ahead. Don't look here, don't look here, and don't look back there because you need to look at where you're going. Otherwise, your vehicle's gonna go in the direction your head is tilted. And he said, as soon as they started around the corner, his fear took over and he looked at the wall. He was afraid of crashing into the wall. And his instructor grabbed his chin and made him face the direction that he was going. Hmm. And the car, you know, made it where it was supposed to. Yeah. Yeah. That's a good illustration for... Um, for but what about my yoke forward. is easy and my burden is light? It can't be living hell. Or we're not doing it right. So no. it's a combination of both. So all of those who seek to live a godly life will be persecuted. Mm -hmm. So if we're not experiencing yes, any persecution. If, we're, if, we're, if we have his yoke and his burden, mm -hmm. then we can get through it. We can get through it. So it's not just like yeah. your own will powering through it like a marathon. I'm not sure I love that metaphor. Which one? I, mean, I wouldn't disagree with the author of Hebrews. No, no. <laughs> I'm, I'm talking about like a running marathon. I think mm -hmm. when you have God's grace... Somehow you can be in a really hard race, and yet you have this like joy, grace. It's like a peace and a surrender. We'll get there. We'll get there. Oh, okay. Okay. Just calm down. We'll get there. Yeah. But the race is hard. Yeah. Right. The Christian life is one of constant conflict. There's always things trying to pull us off the track. Okay. Yeah. Um, and the idea of it, that is set before us. Um, planned beforehand. Of course. Yeah. That's what that means. Um, but when I think of it set before us, it means it's not optional. Okay? 
Um, so my fat 40 year old body can say, yep, yeah, marathon is not my future. That is optional for me. The Christian life is what it is. It's not optional, all right? But now we're gonna, we're gonna get to where you just go away from verse two, okay? Um, verse two, looking to Jesus, right? And so that could go with your illustration, right? We wanna keep our attention focused on, on Jesus as we run this race, okay? Now here, um, founder and perfecter of our faith. So what does that mean? So I look this up. The word founder can also be translated prince or captain. So kind of a weird, um, kind of a weird word here. Um, and so what I think it has the idea is that he is the leader of the faith. He is the originator of our faith, right? So as founder. So what do we see in the earthly ministry of Jesus? One who was constantly in reliance upon the Father, right? He who was, he who was in the divine nature, yet he constantly depended on the Father. Um, and there's this idea in which Jesus, even before the incarnation, was one who in his relationship with the Father, had faith in the Father, relied on the Father. So, um, and so what I think we're gonna get to here in a minute is, um, because he says, Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, um, Jesus's and our, our faith is the same, right? Like the faith that Jesus has is the same faith that we have. Maybe different in, 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 in value or degree, but it's not different or distinct. And that was what, that's what allows him to be the perfect example, right? Um, and so um, if we think about race car driving, because you brought that up, right? If, if Jesus gets a Corvette and I get a minivan, I can't look to Jesus as the, as the, the, the founder of my racing ability because we're driving two different cars. It's just not fair. Jesus is gonna blow it away and here I am gonna be trudging along in my minivan, okay? But the idea here is, is that we have the same faith as him. We have the same access and faith as he had. Um, so he is the founder and the perfecter. The perfecter is a word that comes from the word, Greek word talios, which means um, the end or the result, uh, the completion, the perfection of something. And so he is the one who has brought faith to the final end that it was supposed to go to, right? And he did that because he finished the course, right? So he is the perfecter, the finisher. And so we can have confidence in the faith that God has given us because that faith was also given to Jesus. Jesus finished the race with, the race with that faith. And so if I have the same faith as him, I can finish the race as well. And so we put our, we have our faith in God and just as Jesus was successful, so can we. Right? And so it kind of um, gives us encouragement in that. Dan, you're giving me some looks. You got any ideas? Okay. All right. Um, now, um, so now, so now we come to what I think we were talking about. Okay. Who for the joy, right? And this is what I love. All right. So I'm doing more teaching tonight than, than letting you guys talk. So, but uh, I really like this passage. And uh, we talked about this throughout, the, throughout these, these lessons, but other times as well. God is constantly seeking to motivate us by our own desires, right? And he's saying, you know, come to me because my yoke is light and my burden is easy, right? Like that sounds great. He's motivating us by our own desires, right? Come to me because I can give you joy. He's constantly motivating us by, by our own desire for joy. And what's beautiful here is that Jesus was motivated by the same thing. Jesus was motivated by joy. It's not that Jesus came into the world and did all that he did, ultimately death on a cross, and it was just like duty, duty, duty. Like I just have to do it, I have to do it, I have to do it, I have to do it. No, Jesus, like us, is filled with joy and was motivated by joy. So who for the joy that was set before him, all right? What was set before him? Well, the same thing that was set before us, okay? The race set before us, set before him. 
he had a race to endure as well. Now, his race is a little bit different. The, uh, um, the, uh, the course is a little bit different, but the result is the same. What was Jesus's, what was the purpose of Jesus's race? To finish it in obedience to the Father. What is our race? To finish it in obedience to the Father. The courses of our lives might be a little bit different, right? I mean, I'm not going to die on a cross. And if I do, I'm definitely not going to suffer the, the sins of humanity. But our courses might be different, but the race is the same. So the joy that was set before him, right? The race before him endured the cross, okay? So his race came to enduring the cross. What does it mean to endure something? To bear it. To bear it. Right? To, to, to suffer through it and to get through it. Right? The cross did not prevent him. It could have. I mean, theoretically. Not actually, but theoretically. It could have got to the point Jesus was like, nope, I'm out. I'm not going to the cross. But that was his race. That is what he endured. Okay? Um, and so the, the reason for, or the basis for Jesus is enduring the cross was the joy that it would accomplish. The reason he could endure the hardship of the, of the cross was because of the joy that would result from it. And I think there's, um, in, the, um, in the book of Hebrews, we often see a lesser to greater argument, right? Um, you know, don't, don't worship Moses. Don't, don't revere Moses because Jesus is greater. Don't look at the, old, the, the high priest of the old covenant. Look to Jesus because his priesthood is better, right? And I think what we see here is, you know, if Jesus could endure everything, including the cross, then if we have that same faith, how should we not at least be able to endure our race, right? And it's, and it's even as brutal as the cross was in terms of the, the outward manifestation of physical suffering, the event of the cross of him becoming sin on our behalf was way worse than anything we could ever experience, right? So for, for joy, he's able to endure the cross, uh, despising the shame, right? So the experience of the cross was not pleasant, but it was ultimately shameful. Um, now, likely, I think this is, is referring to the whole episode of the cross. So the, what we refer to as the whole passion experience, um, and, and including when he bore our shame, all right? Now, when I use the word shame, does that bring your remembrance to any Bible passage really close to the beginning of our book? Um, they were naked and what? Ashamed. Well, at first they were unashamed, right? They were not ashamed. Adam and Eve were, were naked and there was perfect happiness and joy in front of one another. Then they sinned, and they felt shame. So in chapter 3, verse 7, they take fig leaves to cover themselves. Or I don't know if it's fig leaves, but some kind of leaf to cover themselves. And then in verse 10, God comes walking in the garden. What do they do? They hide themselves, right? Now think about the relationship between Jesus and the Father. Had there ever been a moment of shame? Never, Right? But in the cross, we see shame um, magnified, right? Not only is he physically shamed because he's naked, because his clothes have been taken away and given to, um, given to, the, to the soldiers, he's physically nude as he's being hung on that cross so that he's publicly shamed before all the spectators. But more significantly, he bears our sin. He becomes the sin bearer. Our sin is imputed to him so that now there is shame between him and the Father. Which is why we get that passage, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Right? This is what Christ is enduring. He's enduring public shame before man, but because of sin, he is now has this shame before the Father. Right? He endures all of this. This is the cross. This is what it is. All right? Despising for this joy that is before him. And the joy that is before him is that he is seated at the right hand of the throne of God, right? He is brought to this place of, of prominence with the Father, right? Now, as I was uh, 
preparing for Revelation night, I read this. And this is, I'll leave you with this. Revelation chapter 3, verse 21. The one who conquers, right? And so I think in, in Revelation language, conquers is the one who finishes the race. The one who perseveres to the end. The one who overcomes, okay? To him who conquers, I will grant him to sit with me on my throne as I also conquered and sat down with my father on his throne. That's the joy that's set before us. The joy that was set before Jesus is that when he endured to the end and he conquered, he got to see, be seated at the right hand of the Father. What's the joy that we have? If we persevere to the end, if we conquer, if we overcome, if we finish the race, we'll be seated with Jesus on his throne. Any questions, comments? All right, let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for your goodness and your grace. And Lord, we thank you so much for your word and the way that it encourages us. Father, let us be those who look to the race that is before us, turning our eyes to Jesus, the perfecter, the author of our faith, he who has already gone before and who has already accomplished and conquered. May we look to him and may we run in the same faith that he ran in. And may you bring us by that faith to the end that we may be seated at the right hand of Christ on his throne. Father, how we long for the day of our Christ coming when he will make all things new and this life will be forever different. There will be no longer these prayer requests that we endure with, with moms who have heart issues and husband and fathers with covering from cancer and eye injuries and uh, homelessness and uh, all these things. Those things will vanish away and we will be with you, O oh God. We will be with Christ, our Lord and our Savior. And so let us, Lord, in those times of weariness, when we are running the race and we grow weak, we grow faint, let us look to Jesus. And may you give us strength through him. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.